What's good, Illini Nation? It's your man in the middle, Deion Thomas. And hey, as always, I tell you, I'm going to bring you the best. And there is no doubt that he is one of our absolute best today. And I was sitting back thinking, since we have Duke coming up tomorrow, who the heck could I bring on this uh, on this show? So there was only two people I could think of. One is Keyron Garris, and the other is today's guest. Just a little bit of a rundown with for my man, the number 18 score in Illinois history. According to Bleacher Report, one of our top 50 players in Illinois basketball history. Now, that says a lot about this guy. In my opinion, one of the best two-way players to ever play, not just at the University of Illinois, but in college basketball itself. My friend, my little brother, as I like to call him, because uh, Lion Eye Nation, you wouldn't have him if I didn't host him on his trip. <laughs> we got Jerry Hester in the house. Jay Hess, what's up, baby? Hey, how you doing, Big D? And yes, hey. you are you are a big brother, and you are correct. If it wasn't for you, it could be a different scenario. I may not be here. Oh, well, we got you here, and that's what was important. <laughs> I think maybe that's why Coach Collins and Coach Henson was like, hey, you hang out with the young fellow today. Um, but no, I'm glad, man. We had a great time, and I'm glad at really? the end of the trip you ended up in Orange, brother, because I can't think of a better player, better player, better player, and better person that could have worn that uniform. Thank you. Appreciate it. So, Jay Hess, we got a lot going on today, a lot we want to touch base on, but I want to go back, first of all, and talk about your career. I mean, you played at Illinois, ended up playing five years because of the injury, but also you played for two different head coaches. So, I'd like to say, first of all, let's start off. How was it playing for Coach Henson, and how was that, you know, how did you even become interested in the University of Illinois, let alone before I got a chance to host you? Well, you know, it, it goes back to, you know, the days in Peoria. You know, uh, being able to watch. I was always a, a sports fan growing up. And so watching college basketball in the 80s, the early 80s into the mid 80s and seeing players like Ephraim Winters, Bruce Douglas, and then had the opportunity to see Peoria's finest, Tony Weisinger and Doug Altenberger, where the orange and blue. That's where the first love started was to see pure guys that came from, from the same place that I came from to actually go to a place like the University of Illinois. So that was like the first, the start of it. And then obviously a few years after that, you had the Flying Illini, which, yeah. you know, who didn't love that team? Um, and of course, you know, for, from there, you know, I started to get into high school and that was one of the schools that I that I really wanted to, to go to. So your high school career picked up as you're watching these other guys play. Did you play any other sports or was it only basketball? No, I actually, uh, I ran track too. And uh, I went I went to state and most people don't notice. I actually went down state and tracked my junior year in high school in the 110 hurdles and was going to come back my senior year with one of the best times. But because they had this strange rule that running us having a spring sport, I couldn't do like some of the all star games you know, once the basketball season was over. So I had to choose. And so my senior year, I didn't go out for, for the hurdles. I just concentrated on basketball. And, get, and by that time, I had already uh, picked the University of Illinois. But it was uh, it, it was interesting. So, you know, Coach McClain, who, you know, uh, was a, like a second father figure, grow, you know, growing up in Peoria, uh, you know, he was my homeroom teacher. Uh -huh. And a funny story. So him being my homeroom teacher, he, you know, he, he was very, as people know, and you've been around Coach McClain, you know, he tells you just like it is. He, yeah. he doesn't beat around the bush. And I remember getting my first letter my sophomore year from a bunch of schools. And one of them, the first big time school was University of, of Iowa. Mm. And it was this written letter had Dr. Tom Davis on it. And I gave it to Coach McClain and he said, nah, bro. He said, he said this isn't handwritten. He said, there's about 10,000 other students that got this same letter. This don't mean crap. <laughs> and he didn't say crap if you know Coach, Coach McClain. And so I was like, oh man. So, you know, of course I'm feeling high and now all of a sudden he made me feel like I'm the smallest person in the room. And then uh, eventually my first handwritten note was from Lou Henson, which came uh, before my junior, after the first game of my junior year in high school. And then that's where I was like, that's, that's one of my top schools right there. Yeah. Well, uh, man, that's great to hear. And he's right. And I, and I don't know if I would have forgiven you if you had gone to Iowa, man. I might have had to hit you real hard when you was coming across. Well, the <laughs> no, uh -uh. That was, they weren't even in my they weren't even in the radar, <laughs> especially after go. what they did. I didn't know you at the time. But I read the stories and I was like, uh-uh, that's not even in the radar. There you go, my man. But, you know, we go back, we talk about your career. Again, as I mentioned, I think you were one of the best two-way players to play in college basketball. 
was that something that started with you in high school? Because you know, like I know, if you didn't play defense, you didn't play for Coach Henson. Right. So I'm going to assume that this started before. What are some of those things, uh, some of those lessons that were given to you from a high school standpoint that you were able to carry on and take over into Illinois? You know, it's probably, you know, very similar. You know, Manuel, Peoria Manuel was similar to, you know, some of the Chicago schools like a Simeon, like the Chicago King, you know, like a Westinghouse. And especially for Simeon with, with Coach Hamburg that you had, mm -hmm. uh, you know, very, very much about discipline, and, and uh, about the fundamentals of the game. And so, and part of that relied on defense. You definitely had to play defense if you wanted to play for my high school coaches, which is Coach Van Syak, one of the winningest all-time coaches in high school history, let alone in the state of Illinois. Um, and it started on defense. You know, our practices in high school were probably two and a half hours and at least an hour and 45 was defense, anything defensive related. And if you made a mistake on D, it was funny because, you know, you can make a mistake on offense, you know, no big deal. You know, you had a turnover, you get yelled at, no big deal. Make a, a, a bad decision on defense, everybody's run. Yep. And that was for the majority of the practice. Um, and so that defensive philosophy and that, those, those uh, fundamentals were taught to me while I was in high school. So you got to Illinois as well. First of all, let's let's go back. You you came down on your official visit. As I mentioned earlier, Illini Nation, I was his host. Yeah. So let's just say there are some stories that we cannot and will not share on this, but we had a great time that night. Tell yeah. a little bit about not, you know, about not about our your visit, but leading up to your visit, your time on campus and some of the things that you saw that made you want to be an Illini outside of what you had seen when you were in high school. Well, you know, of course, you know, you have those home visits where all the schools come and visit you at home and then you have the opportunity to go to the school. And yeah, while I had already held in high regard the University of Illinois, I hadn't really seen the campus. Mm -hmm. I had been to obviously Assembly Hall, but that was it. And then to be able to walk around campus um, to see people like uh, Terry Cole, yeah. Um, on campus um, um, to see, uh, oh shoot, why am I blanking on his name? Uh, Dr. Anderson, yes. Jim Anderson. Uh, seeing people like that uh, was very uh, important to me. Also, Lynn Cheney, who was the academic advisor, mm -hmm. uh, which was important to me and my parents, you know, to, to hear from them, uh, you know, was very important. So from a basketball standpoint, obviously being able to hang around you and the rest of the team to, you know, kind of see. And of course, you know, you, you feel like you're going to fit in, but, you know, you want to see how you will fit in. And of course, my personality, along with everybody else on the team and with Keywan Garris, who was on the, uh, the recruiting trip as well. Um, and of course, we became, uh, you know, like brothers, you know, too. Um, you know, that was important, but it was off, off the court or outside of basketball that was important. And I tell you, you know, one thing, and, and you know, we live in a different time now, but for me and my parents, one of the big things was to see people that looked like me in positions uh, in higher education. And so to see a Dr. Anderson, to see a Terry Cole was very important uh, in my decision making. Well, you know, and you touched on that. And that's one of the areas where I have to say I'm very proud to be an Illini because, you know, there's been some talk about oh, the campus is racist and this and this and this. But throughout my time and I was there before you, there's always been black people in positions of power. Now, of course, this year we had, you know, not this year, but now we have a new chancellor, which we had the first black chancellor with Chancellor Jones and, and some of the other people that are in place. But, and throughout the various colleges, there are, there've always been people of color and, and, and women and in higher uh, positions. So I think you, the University of Illinois in that rank is rather pro progressive, uh, you know, compared to some of our big 10 peers. Like, you know, you and I do the radio now, but I'm also, the um, associate director of development. And I remember going to my first big 10 uh, development officers meeting. There were no other black uh, <laughs> development officers, maybe one, I'm sorry, there was one outside yeah. of, you know, myself, Howard, Kevin Mitchell on the University of Illinois campus. And I was, wow. I was blown away by just, you know, the lack of color that was in that room. So mm. I, I'm not surprised knowing you and knowing your, your mom and dad that that was a, a big stepping stone or, or a good hint for, for you to look at the University of Illinois. Right. No, exactly. And uh, it was, uh, and I mean, 
But, you know, the, the whole picture, too. I mean, from a University of Illinois standpoint, you know, the campus, the education is, uh, is second to none. So, you know, if you, you couple that with the idea of, of wanting to see diversity and knowing that the university is held in a high regard academically, uh, all that together, along with the fact that in the Big Ten, you know, have a chance to go to the NCAA tournament to compete for Big Ten championships, it was a, it was a, a, a no-brainer at, at the end of the day. Yeah, you know, you and I, and I'd say this, I don't think Coach Henson gets enough uh, respect for as good a coach as he as he was and yeah. as good a mentor as he as he was. Now, can you tell a little bit about your time with Coach Henson? I mean, and, and on that team, because you, like I said, mentioned, you didn't play defense, you didn't play for him. No, exactly, right. You know, and <laughs> coach was tough. Coach was tough on everyone in their own way. Yes, Yep. You know, this how how did his influence help you to become the player and the person that you are? You know, it's interesting. You know, when you go through the recruiting process, you know, everybody tells you how great you are. And it's, it's funny that I never forget when I finally stepped on campus and, you know, you know, we had the, the pregame, you know, the preseason games and, you know, the coaches weren't allowed to be in there. And then we had the first practice and it was like, yes, here we go. And I had played well in the preseason. You know, we were playing up at MP and I'm feeling good about where I'm at, we got in that first practice, and, uh, you know, I want to say within five minutes in that first practice, Coach Henson let me know, you know, kind of who he was. <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't all smiles anymore. It was like, hey, you got to play at a different level now. And, you know, we had to play defense. And mm -hmm. I, I prided myself on defense, but I didn't know that you had to take another step. And, uh, and he let me know within five minutes of that first practice that uh, this is a different level. And, and you got to bring it. And but at the same time, I would say um, he always gave you an opportunity uh, to correct mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pe people would joke about the fact that he would run up and down the sideline and, you know, just kind of look a little bit uh, crazy. But he wasn't. I mean, he it was a method to his madness uh, at all times. And you know, whether he yelled at you or not, and uh, he always let you know why you did something wrong. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just I'm going to yell at you and. And, you know, figure it out. It was going to yell at you. I may not tell you right now because we got to finish practice, but eventually I'm going to come back to you and tell you why, why, I may, why I yelled at you and why you made the mistake and here's how you can correct it. Well, I, I'll tell you this, Jay, and then I'm saying this. I thought you had a heck of a freshman year. Uh, you, you know, that was at a time when we were struggling a little bit. They had cut our scholarships, so we had some yeah. walk-ons playing. Man, you had a heck of a first year. So can you talk about your growth from year one to year, well, let's say three, because that's when you were with Coach Henson. Then you got injured. And then the next year, uh, Coach Kruger came in. Well, it was, uh, so that first year was, you know, it was, I wouldn't say, well, I didn't shoot the ball particularly well, but I played defense. That's how I got on the court. Exactly. <laughs> and, and on the offensive end, it was, it was two things. Get the ball to Dion. <laughs> and then get the ball to Dion. And then the third thing, if you couldn't get the ball to Dion, try to find Kiwan or Richard Kate on the perimeter. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was all about defense. So it, it was pretty easy my freshman year, the fact that I didn't I wasn't relied on the score. I was relied on to play D, come in and play D on on, on uh, some very good players around the Big Ten. But from that the thing I learned about that first year is, is a lot of the leadership that it took, you know, from guys like you, TJ Wheeler, Tom Michael, who were seniors on that team. Also, Gene Cross, you know, didn't play a lot, but brought it every day in practice. You know, let me know that, you know, this is a team environment. It's not just about playing 30, 40 minutes a game because Gene didn't play at all. Yeah. Uh, but he brought it every single day. Uh, and then to see the work ethic that you, again, T.J. Wheeler and Tom Michael put in, helped prepare me to when I was going to be a leader in, in the future. You know, whether it's my sophomore, junior, senior year, you know, seeing the way you guys led really helped me out. And so there was a progression there. You know, that first year was more about, hey, strictly defense. That's how you get on the court. To my sophomore year, it was like, okay, you're expected to step up a little bit more, play a little bit more on the offensive end, not just the defensive end. And that's where Coach Henson was was really vital, as well as Coach Collins, uh, Coach Coons, and Coach Nagy. Uh, mm -hmm. All four of the coaches uh, were very good about, uh, you know, letting you know your role. And the one thing that I never forget, Coach Collins uh, said, and you hear this occasionally, but he was one of the first ones that I really heard it from, is that be a superstar in your role. Yes. You know, and it's, 
you hear the word superstar and immediately people think, okay, that person has to average 30 points, eight rebounds, nine assists, and that's a superstar. No, that's a superstar for what his role is. That's what he's supposed yeah. to do, and that's what his uh, athletic ability uh, dictates. Whereas somebody else, you know, like myself, you know, going from my freshman to, to my senior year, the superstar role just changed. But I still wanted to be a superstar in my particular role. Um, and in my junior year, that's when we beat Duke, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But uh, that year, we had a really good year. We were 12-1. and one. And then Kiwan actually got hurt the first six games of the Big Ten season. We were in the top 11 in the country going into the Big Ten season. But he got hurt the first six or seven games. I think we won one game. <laughs> or maybe we lost all games. He came back and played 20 minutes of the Purdue game. And I think that was the first game, Big Ten game we won that year on the road. And then I got hurt the last five games, uh, twisting my ankle. So we ended up missing uh, the tournament because of these injuries. You know, we were healthy. We were healthy, and I remember Coach Henson and I talked about this a few years ago. Uh, one of the last times I was able to see him is that uh, when we were all healthy, we lost two games that whole year. Wow. And uh, and and but it didn't work out because we had a lot of injuries. And then next year, that's when Coach Kruger came in, and that's when I had my big injury with the back injury, and I had to sit out. Yeah, you know, you touched on something, and the Lion Nation will appreciate this. First of all, I'm going to draw the comparison between your growth and the growth of DeMonte Williams. Mm, yes. Yep. You know, because what he came in at, and you, you know this, when you were on the air, the same as I'm on the air, you had a lot of people attacking DeMonte because he wasn't scoring, he wasn't doing right. this, but they didn't understand he was a superstar and is a superstar in his role. Yes. I hadn't seen a player probably more valuable in the Big Ten than DeMonte Williams at his role all the way through up into his senior year now. Can you talk no a little bit about maybe some of those similarities and what you see and what he has done, which is very similar to what you did? Yeah, you know, I, I see a lot of similarities. And, you know, he was a player that, you know, it, and I, I don't think you made this purposely, but the fact that we both came from Peoria, both went to the went to Manual High School, you know, we both came in with the same idea. He knew his freshman year, the only way he'd get on the court is if he played defense. Uh, the difference between when I played and he played was social media. <laughs> you know, if there was social media back then, I'm sure I would have got tore up a lot of times because I didn't shoot the ball well, but I kept shooting. <laughs> so and I, played, and I, I didn't shoot. I had a great percentage my freshman year, but, I, but, but I, I, I gained, I guess, some fans because of the hustle. And I actually won that that prestigious Kenny Battle Award my first two years at the University of Illinois because, you know, even though I didn't shoot the ball well, I still played with a lot of hustle. And I think mm -hmm. that's what you saw in DeMonte's first couple of years. And what you see now is a player that has grown and you, you see the development and the work ethic that he has that he's always had. Uh, and it's just now he's starting to, 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 you know, the reins have been pulled back a little bit to let him, you know, uh, to create a little bit more. And you can see him hitting open shots. And his confidence is through the roof. But that is due to the amount of work that he's put into it mm -hmm. and uh, to put himself in this position in his senior year. But you're exactly right. I think as far as in his role, uh, and again, you can say how MVP is determined. But right now he's playing some of the best basketball on the team, if not the best basketball you know, on the team for what his role is. Yeah, no doubt. And I mean, and yes, I, I did. I knew the whole manual connection. That's why I wanted to pull that in there. But no, I mean, watching him and watching what he does for that team, it, it just takes me back to what you did for us, you know, our yeah. first year. And again, watching where he is now was exactly where you are, uh, where you were going into your senior year. So so I got a question for you, though, Dion. So, you know, that freshman year, did, did, did you used to curse me out when, when you'd be in the post? And I, I take that jump shot. <laughs> of course not. I would never curse you out, Jerry. Yeah, no, okay. I All, right. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, I'd say this. I, I, we were talking about being superstars in your role. <laughs> I, I knew what my role was. And, and I knew if I, if I did not score the way I was supposed to, Coach Henson was going to get on me. So right, right. he was going to get on me. I had to make sure that, you know, as they say, it rolls downhill. <laughs> so I had to make sure I got on you guys. But what a lot of people may not understand, and this is, I'll be forever um, appreciative of this. You threw me the assist to break the record. Oh, no doubt. Johnson's record. 
Yeah, no doubt. And then, and you know what? It was on accident, but I tell everybody, hey, <laughs> hey that, that pass was like, if there's no film of it, that was like Magic Johnson coming down with a no look. But of course, it was like a simple, a simple <laughs> bounce pass into the post, and you did did what Dion does with that little uh uh hook, and it was over. Well, well, I'm with you. It's gonna be a it's gonna be a Magic Johnson behind the neck pass. It was beautiful oh, transition. We don't have to tell nobody unless they go and find it themselves. <laughs> man, hey, it's, it's, I can't find it on YouTube. So hey, it was. That was one of the best passes ever thrown in college basketball. No doubt in my mind. I'm with you 100%. <laughs> so you have a great Illinois career. Again, as I mentioned earlier, you finish as the 18th score. you ranked 18th all-time in scoring. You have a professional career. I mean, I'm sure, like most, was it NBA or bust for you? Or were you just like, you know what, let me – let me ride this horse and enjoy this game and, and learn what I can take from it, regardless of where it is on the planet. Well, you know, it wasn't NBA or bust. Uh, and that was it's for a few reasons. You know, it's interesting because, you know, I had an opportunity to go through the experience in some regard with you. Mm-hmm. You know, what you went through uh, getting ready for the NBA uh, draft and actually being there with you during the NBA draft and never forgetting that sec- first pick of the second round. I'm saying deep. And thinking it was you to the Bulls, and it was Dickie Simpkins, like, <laughs> yep, <laughs> you and me uh, both. <laughs> yeah, yes, right, right. But uh, and then obviously you going over and, and having a career playing overseas, and being able to somewhat experience experience that through you, you know, through my college years, it was like, oh, there's this big world out here that you can go play anywhere and, and have success. So by the time I got to the point where you know, I was leaving the University of Illinois. You know, I knew that there were more opportunities than just the NBA. And, and the, the other other uh, event that happened was, you know, my back injury. You know, the fact that, you know, I thought that, you know, basketball could be taken away from me, period. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, at, at that point, it was like, you know, yes, I, I love the game. So if, I, if regardless of where I play, if I, have an, if I have an opportunity to continue to play, I'll do that anywhere in the world. And so... Uh, and so, yes, when the opportunity presented itself to to uh, to play overseas, and really at the time it was the NBA lockout as well yeah. uh, when I came out, and so didn't get drafted uh, and got invited to a couple of camps, but there really wasn't camp yeah. uh, once the lockout happened. There were camps before that, and I went up to Milwaukee and had a had a great experience up there for a couple of days, but then the lockout happened, and it was like, okay, well, what are you going to do? Um, and then, you know, I had the opportunity to go overseas. And as, as I'm sure that you could tell everybody, you know, you get over there and you realize how big the world is, how different it is, but how some things are similar. And it really just broadens your horizons. And I loved every minute of playing uh, my ba- playing basketball in Europe. Yeah, and it's so funny you mentioned that lockout and because I've had people in the past ask me, well, why didn't you stay? Why didn't you come back? I said, well, the, the actual plan was for me to come back the next year, which was that 95 year. And then yeah. the NBA went on strike and I went back. And then that year I met Daphne. And I was like, okay, well, <laughs> you know, there's, <laughs> right. there's a need for me to really come back over here. I'm doing well. So you and I, we didn't cross paths, unfortunately, throughout my, my long career, but we did play in the same place. And I yep. tell everyone, Israel is one of the best countries in the world. Can you talk a little bit about your experience there? Because I know you played in Poland. I know you played in Serbia and yep. England, I believe it was. Played well. in London, too. Right, yeah. in London. Yeah. And then um, in Israel. If you had to pick one of those places, what's your point? You know, it's, it's tough because, you know, I played in Poland for, what, almost three and a half years. And so the love that people show me, even to this day, you know, it's hard not to pick, you know, a place that, you know, where you spent that much time. But as far as just the beauty and the brief experience I had in Israel, it is definitely one of the best uh, countries. And I had an interesting experience leading up to that. So I signed with uh, Maccabi Ramagan, which is right there in Tel Aviv, yep. uh, next to the team that you played for. Uh, but I was due to leave September 11, 2001. Uh. Uh, and then I never forget, you know, lead, even leading up to that, my mom and my sister. Uh, one of my sisters who lives, she lives in D.C., so she knew a lot about, you know, what was going on politically around the world because she lived right there in D.C. And so she knew some of the things that were happening in Israel even before September 11th. 
and she did not want me to go over to Israel. And so mm -hmm. she convinced my mom that how bad it was to call me and tell me not to go. And I was like, I'm going. Right. But first of all, I love the game. It's a great opportunity. And oh, by the way, the contract's pretty good. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> so but then September, so that happens that morning, I get a phone call and my sister uh, calls and you know wakes us up. And my wife is, is on the phone saying, what? And I can hear her talking and she says, hold on, I'll let you talk to your brother. And she says, you can't go a plane crash. And I was like, why would you tell me a plane crash the morning I'm about to fly? And she said, no, turn on your TV. And of course, turn on my TV and saw everything that unfolded. And so, you know, couldn't leave for about a week and a half. The team called me every day and mm -hmm. said they still wanted me. You know, when things have an opportunity, you can fly over here. And we'll be ready for you. And then uh, got the opportunity, went over there. And I was a little, you know, uh, unsure about what I was going to see because just based on what you read yeah. and what you see in the media, and I say in the media because we both and both have been in the media and still in the media, you know, some of that cannot be all what they say it is. True. And got over to Tel Aviv and fell in love. A great place. Um, you know, it's a beautiful place. Uh, the only thing is, you know, one of the first nights I got over there, we had a couple days off. My teammates say, hey, you know, let's go out and have have a drink, you know, hang out. I was like, oh, okay. 1030 rolls around midnight. I'm like, where are these guys at? <laughs> you know, parties don't start till 1 a.m. over there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was a little bit different, but lo loved it. Good. It's so funny when I tell people that I was like, yeah, we're eating dinner at 1030. Man, you know, and, and I was like, if it, you were out after that, I was like, that's when life begins over in Europe. And it's so funny when, you know, everyone thinks or has this idea of what Israel is, and it's always totally different than what they are. They either think it's ultra religious, or they think there's bombs dropping all the time. And I'm like, no, <laughs> it's no, totally yeah. the opposite. You know, I, I had so much fun there, and of course, my wife's family is still there, so we go over every year. But, you know, I, I can't say enough things to say about it. I'm glad you had a great time uh, while you were there as well. Again, well. You know, another thing, too, this, uh, you know, this whole Illinois connection is uh, before I went over there, Tal Brody, I reached out to him, didn't know him, had no idea who he was, but uh, reached out to the godfather of Illinois basketball, Ron Cardinal, who connected us at the time. And this is, you know, before text messaging and, and all that stuff, you know, just uh, plain old email. Um, mm -hmm. And so Tal Brody emailed me and told me, hey, you know, you will you will love it when you get here. And he sent me some stats, which, you know, kind of, you know, threw me off. But it was kind of a reality check of when you live in a certain place, you have this idea of what life is supposed to be about. And so you think about crime and you mentioned, you know, some of the, the bombs that, you know, that have happened in that area. But on the flip side, they, they, they didn't they don't really have regular crime. True. Uh, you know, as, as much as we do here, uh, random shootings and things like that of just people walking down the street. And so mm -hmm. there were some stats that were pretty interesting that, you know, more people die in Chicago of certain types of crime than any 10 year history of suicide bombing. Yep. And I was like, wow, you know, it kind of really opened my eyes to the fact that, you know, sometimes it's, you know, you have to have a you have to broaden your horizons and look at look at the world differently just what you've experienced, you know, in your little bubble. Very true. And it's so funny. It's so good that you mentioned Tao because it was really that same thing with me. I didn't know Tao before I got to Maccabi Tel Aviv, you know, and I walk in and he's in my, in the practice the very first day and comes over, introduces <laughs> himself and, and gives me his rundown of, his, of course, his time at Illinois and then why he didn't go to the NBA, but chose to come over. And since that time, Tao has become one of my best friends, uh, mm. And we we talk often, so I'm, I'm glad he was able to reach out and you were able to connect with him as well on that level because it's a great man and that's a great place. Yeah, no, the only thing, he was actually, he wasn't in Israel at the time. He was traveling, he was on vacation. And so Always traveling. Was interesting. I was only in Israel for a little over two months because that year there was a, uh, there was a, a lot, the Israeli players had their own, uh, their own, um, right. Yeah, I remember day. that. They had a strike. And so it was, and at the time, you could have up to five, you know, what they call Bosman A and Bosman B players. Yeah. Um, which is, which and, is, for those that don't know, five foreigners. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, and so the Bosman, so what the was the Bosman A the United States and basically Bosman B or was it was it the reverse? But no, Bosman A was the United States and yeah. Bosman B was like the remainder of, of Europe before it became the yeah. European Union. Yeah, so you know, back in the olden days when we played, you know, it could only be basically you could have two Americans. Yeah. And then you could have Israel's a little bit different because you could have three or four Mm-hmm. Uh, Bosman B players or other players that were from other other countries outside the U.S. And so the problem was is that the team that I was on had no center or no no Israeli player that was taller than six six seven. Oh wow! Uh, and they had no point guard. And so all of their players, even though I was probably one or two best players on the team, they had somebody in my position. So they needed a point. They needed a big guy. Which they brought over, which was uh, a seven foot uh, American guy. I think Ryan Stack was his name. Oh know. yeah, I know Ryan. Yep, and then um, Danny Lewis, uh, mm-hmm. who played, and he was a point guard. And so those were the two Americans that they had. And so it was a situation where you know they were trying to figure out whether they could keep me. Some, you know, they wanted me to stay over to see if things would change with with the ruling. And my agent had got me another opportunity. And I think that year I went back to Poland because, you know, they really wanted me back anyway. And so I kind of got double paid for a couple of months. So I was hey. like, okay, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll leave. I'll leave. I don't want to, but I, I'll leave. Oh, so that's I always good when you get to, two checks. Yeah, so I, did, I didn't get a chance to spend as much time in Israel as I would have obviously liked. But that couple of months still left a huge impact on me. Well, we got to get you back over there because I will say this. They remember you. Uh oh, I've had conversations. Yeah, I've had conversations with people, and they were like, "Oh yeah, you went, you know, when I went to Illinois, they were like, oh, yeah, and Jerry Hester was here, and Brian Randall, and D. Brown.' You know, they run down a list of Illinois players that have gone wow. through Israel. I mean, and they know it off the back of their hand. So, of course, now Malcolm is over there. So that Illini train right. just keeps yeah. moving and going through there. But let's talk a little bit about what you're doing now, because you did you worked for with uh, Busey, right? No, Mm-mm. no. Uh, so I was uh, after I got done playing, um, I got into the insurance business, kind of just fell into it. You know, you know, I don't think anybody grows up saying that, you know, five, six years old, say, hey, I'm going to be in the insurance business. <laughs> Nobody does. That. I, I would have to agree with you on that. <laughs> so I grew up wanting to play basketball and wanting to be the next Brian Gumble. Those were my two dreams. OK, uh, not insurance, but kind of fell into the insurance business. And, and and re- really enjoyed it. You know, I was uh, felt like I was making an impact on people's lives. Mm-hmm. Got more into financial services uh, in general, as far as investments and insurance. Uh, and so started that with Northwestern Mutual, and again the U of I connection with uh, John Wright, uh, who was a football star at Illinois. You know, uh, a long time ago, uh, but is also well known as as. Uh, you know, for his work in the financial services industry. And Brian McClure, who played baseball at Illinois uh, in the early, late 80s, early 90s. Um, and then so I was there and then had another Illinois connection when I left Northwestern Mutual. I joined my, my mentor, Dave Downey, who was right there in Champaign, still holds a single game all the time, scoring record at 53 points yep. in the game back in the 60s. So that tells you something about his ability. No three-point um, shot and put up. No three-point shot. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, and still shot like 60% from the field. So, yeah. Uh, so, but but uh, even though he was a great Illinois player, he's probably more well-known as, in my opinion, being the Michael Jordan of the life insurance industry. So I had a great opportunity to learn under him. And right when I stopped doing the radio, I was uh, embarking on my own company. And I started my own uh, insurance firm. And so doing the same thing, uh, financial services, more around, you know, mitigating or eliminating some tax exposures using, you know, tools like life insurance for uh, individuals, family offices, some institutions. So, uh, but but we're, we're doing pretty good. Good. And what's the name of that? So we can let the Illini fans hear it. So, you know, maybe we can, you know, drum up some phone calls over there, man. <laughs> we know my marketing is so strong. I had to name it, you know, I, I, I got real creative on the name. Uh-oh. Esther Insurance Group. So, <laughs> <laughs> hey, so but, but that was that was done purposely because uh, I, I had a, a a group of I'd say mentors uh, that I talked to before before I, I, I 
took on this, uh, this this new endeavor. And you know, they said, hey, if you should probably have your name in the in, in the title of the company because if people pick up the phone because of you, not because of the name of the company. And so if they know that if they hear that name, they may pick it up. So hopefully my name has meant something. <laughs> no, your, your name has meant a lot, man. It's meant a lot to Illini Nation. I mean, you're one of our best, as I've mentioned, and, and one of my closest friends and, and even confidants and even my mentor at certain points in, the, in, in this world. You know, you handed over the baton to me for Illinois Basketball Radio. So, you know, from time to time, especially in that first year, you know, you and I talked often about how to do this thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, you know, it was interesting because, you know, it's, it's like a big chain link fence. You know, all of us and how we're connected at the University of Illinois. We may not have played directly with each other, mm-hmm. but like we just talked about with Tom Brody, we weren't playing at the same time. We were all connected in some way. And so in the same way I came in, you know, Steve Bardo had done it. And and it was the same thing. You know, I called him nonstop like, hey, man, <laughs> like, uh you know, hey, this is a little different. You know, how do I do this? You know, when should I, you know, you know, come in here and 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 also Brian, Brian Barnhart makes it so easy. Daddy does. Um, you know, he's he you know, I joke about the fact that he is the Urban Magic Johnson of broadcasting because he'll set you up. All you gotta do is dunk. Right? Very true. You know, <laughs> he puts you in the right spot and he does a great job. But you know, but yeah, that Stephen Bardo was that kind of mentor to me, and then when you took over. I was very happy to, to to do the same thing and give you some 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 pointers, but but you're a natural, so you didn't need much at all. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, Jay. No, but your your words and your direction was was big, and as you mentioned with Brian as well. And because of you guys, it, it, it may seem easy, but it, it definitely you know you made it easy for me. So we we talked past, we talked the present. Let's talk about this present Illinois team and going into the future in this game tomorrow is against Duke. What have you seen from Illinois in this first four games um, that has you excited? Well, I think the talent. I mean, from, you know, when you look at from top to bottom, I mean, this is a very talented group. I mean, you take that that last game, everybody, you know, the media has talked about Io and Kofi, Io and Kofi, the best one-two punch. You know, Bill Walton even joked it was like Shaq and Kobe, uh, you know, whatever he said. But you got Kofi getting in foul trouble, and then you have a guy like Georgie that can come off the bench and give you 15, you know, <laughs> without without a problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so this team does have some depth uh, on it um, and, and the overall talent. And, and you mentioned a player that I think is a real key in DeMonte Williams. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, I watch the game differently, you know, because I did the radio and I just look at the game very differently. And I think of the growth over Coach Underwood's, you know, four years. You know, you look at his first year and you think about some of the, the problems or issues that you saw going on on the offensive end where they just didn't seem like a cohesive unit. And so I see little things. I, I want to say it was a Chicago State game. It was very small, but I remember DeMonte Williams, DeMonte Williams was dribbling the ball and he was at the same time dribbling, was waving off Corbello to go to a certain spot. Whereas I remember thinking in my head three years ago, he wouldn't even know where to go. And yep. so now you can see that the system that Underwood put in place, now those players have grown up, grown into it, to where now it's kind of second nature. Before mm-hmm. you could see that they were thinking, and I think a combination with the talent and the fact that they really understand what the system's about from the coaching staff, you know, you know, has the potential for this team to go very far and to be the ones cutting down the nets. I agree 100 percent. Let's talk about, you know, we, we talk about that Chicago connection. Let's talk a little bit about that Peoria connection. Adam Miller has looked amazing um, so far this year. Of course, there's a little ups and downs. He's going to look like a freshman right. at times. He and Andre Cabello, can you talk about what you're seeing from the freshmen so far? Yeah, you know, when you look at freshmen, you know, uh, you know, you, you you see what they can be, you know, because like you said, you're going to see the ups and downs. And, and I don't know how many texts I got after the first game and saying, man, Adam Miller's going to be gone at the end of the year. I was like, hold on. I was like, it was one game. He's a freshman. Yes. You know, let him grow into it. And, of course, we saw in the Baylor game, you know, he struggled a little bit. But th- but that's – but 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 you that that's what happens to freshmen. But you can definitely see the talent, the ability – and the basketball IQ on both young players, thinking about Curbelo 
and also uh, Adam Miller. And, uh, and I'll throw a shout out just right now because, you know, Adam Miller went to my grade school. So, <laughs> so there you go. Not started, really. And he went to my grade school, started at my high school and obviously, you know, came up to Chicago. But you can't claim him. He's still from Peoria. Hey, and you get no arguments out of it. I was just glad that because if he had gone to Simeon, then maybe I would be saying something different. He went to Morgan Park. So, yeah, you know, I understand. No, no, no laying down the claim. But well, he's think, the right think, color. About, think about this. So this is my this is my grade school all-time team. You got David Booth, who's second leading scorer wow. in DePaul history. You have Mike Robinson, who went to Purdue, who was a McDonald's All-American. Mm-hmm. You have Brandon Hughes, who was the junior college player of the year, went to Michigan. Uh, Sergio McClain. Wow. Uh, and myself. And then you have Adam Miller. So we, we, we could compete for, for a Sweet 16 spot with, the, with, my, with my grade school team. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue with you at all on that. <laughs> you, you just, you just mentioned six heavy hitters, man. And well, and one soon to be heavy hitter. Cause I, I really love what that young fella is doing. So like you, uh, way back in 1995, you beat Duke. Yep. This game tomorrow is going, I believe, I haven't seen the rankings, rankings come out today, but I believe this will still be a top 10 uh, right, you know, both teams will still be in the top ten as they play this, yeah. as they play tomorrow. What do you see in tomorrow's game? What does Illinois need to do to be successful in tomorrow's game against Duke? I think they need to rebound. Uh, they need to rebound the basketball. I think they need to match the intensity that Duke's going to come out with, especially being at home. Um, you know, they don't have that that six man and the Cameron crazies that that really helps them out um, a lot. And it, every home crowd, you know, is, is helpful uh, in games. Uh, so, so that'll be missing, and that should give Illinois somewhat of an edge. But I think the one thing that I saw, especially in Ohio game, uh, that you know, as good as Demonte is, he's still six three, six four, and the idea that you know Duke has two very athletic six nine players, and in, in, uh, Matthew Hurt and then Jalen uh, Johnson mm-hmm. uh, down low. Uh, you know, could potentially cause some cause some problems for Illinois. Uh, so I think rebounding the basketball is going to be key. And uh, you know, also I think you know I, I, I O, who I think he will step up. You know, needs to needs to step up. You know, in a big way. And it's not so much scoring, just uh, making sure everybody's in the right place at the right time. Um, you know, I think Baylor kind of took him out of his game a little bit, but but I don't I don't anticipate him having. Two, I'd say subpar because he still had 18, six, and five. Right. So uh, two subpar games for him. I don't see that happening. So uh, I think Illinois has a great shot of winning tomorrow night. I got I got one more question for you, Jay, and it's about another one of our freshmen. It's the young guy I have been impressed with in his limited time that he's played is Coleman Hawkins. What, what do you think about the big fella? Because, you know, he has Chicago, Illinois roots and, and Chicago yep. roots. His dad's a CPS guy and before moving out to California. So I always like talking about our own because even though he was raised out there, he's still one right. of us. <laughs> right. <laughs> now, I think he's he's real active. He's, a, he's an active player. Uh, he, he, he doesn't seem like, uh, you know, he doesn't have the deer in headlights look. You know, he looks like, you know, he wants to be out there. Uh, he may not be in the right place at all the time, but that's that's – but he's active. And so, you know, he, he finds a way to, to make an impact or to try to make an impact. Um, and so, and even the other, I guess you call it new guy, even though he's not a freshman, Grandison, mm-hmm. um, I think he has a chance to, to really be special. If Illinois can, can go nine deep. Um, and I look at that Baylor game as, you know, Baylor and Gonzaga are like right now head and shoulders above everybody else. And the reason is their experience. You know, a lot of players that they have, all of them have come back. You have a team like Illinois, talent-wise, is as good or better than those two teams I just mentioned. But they have some players, some young players that they're, you know, trying to incorporate. And so as the season goes on and those players get more experience, um, if Illinois can go nine deep with Grandison and Hawkins, you know, playing playing a role, uh, then this Illinois team has a real chance. Yeah, I, I think you nailed it right on the head. That's been some of my conversations with people is the fact that, you know, has the people come, well, you know, we really got put in our place at Baylor. I say, no, I say, we, we had a three minute run where things kind of got out of hand. And this is right. what older teams 
can they understand one how to make you pay and two how to put a band-aid when those things start happening exactly you have young players that are really important for us and i agree with you where we are now is not where we're going to be later no. i mean we're going to be so much better later because those young players you know as we mentioned with adam as well as Car uh, Carbello, as well as Hawkins. And then we still don't have Austin Hutcherson back. I mean, when he gets back yeah. on court, because he adds another long, active, athletic body that can really shoot the ball at about 40% when he was at the Division Three level, I don't think that's going to fall off that he's on this level, and it's just going to really spread things out. So, Jay Hess, I agree with you, man. Love your analytics, analytics and how you analyze the game and how you see it and, and love having you uh, on today and continuing to be a big part uh, of what we do in the Lion Eye Nation, man. So very proud of the man you have become. I have to say that. Not that I had a whole lot to do with it, but I did have a small piece. You did. You definitely <laughs> and, did. And that, that's, that's, we're just not talking fluff. I mean – you know, this this friendship that we have is, is real. This isn't just for the yeah. for the cameras. You know, the way we're talking right now is is how we talk to each other. So, oh, yeah. uh, so it's I'm definitely look, one little shout out. You go ahead and drop whatever you want to drop to Illini Nation before I close this thing out. You said shout outs? Oh, well, to whomever, whatever you want to do, baby. This is your mic now. Oh man, I don't have any shout outs. I'll just tell you that that other person you're gonna talk to about the Duke game, tell him to pass the ball a little bit more because he didn't pass our time. <laughs> no, <laughs> talking about my, my man Kiwan. That was uh, you know, still one of my best friends as well. So, uh, so I look forward to to seeing that and seeing him uh, answer the question. I'm not gonna give him any uh, insight. I'm, I'm gonna tell him you're gonna ask him some really tough questions. There you go. Uh, and just leave it at that. But, keep him, uh, keep him no, on I'm, his toes. We gotta keep yeah. him on his toes. <laughs> yeah, but no, uh, Illinois has always got a special place. So I still go back, and you know, one thing I didn't mention is you know the fact that. It wasn't just about sports for me. You know, I, I've served on a few different boards at the university uh, for my college, the liberal arts and science uh, college, as well as the uh, alumni association board, which covers all three campuses. So it's, it's never just been about, and I'm a foundation member. So it's never just been about uh, the basketball side for the University of Illinois. It's about uh, the entire school. And, you know, we both have kids. Your, your daughter goes down into Champaign. Yep. You know, my daughter is at UIC. Uh, and also have a niece that's a senior at UIC. So uh, more graduates to come from our families within the University of Illinois family. No doubt, baby. Home. No doubt. Well, Jay Hess, I appreciate you, brother. You know how much I love you. I appreciate you coming love on. You, man. This is the episode. We're going to close out Champagne on Ice. Make sure you give us a listen and a shout out and respect. And hit that little subscribe button. You can find us on Spotify as well as Apple Podcasts. Again, with my man Jerry Hester, one of the absolute best, not just basketball players, but people that I've ever met in my life. This is Deion Thomas closing out. 